Please let me know if you can see my screen here. Oh. Before starting um, today's roundtable and the welcome, I would just like to would like to let you know that this event will be recorded for learning purposes and live streamed also on YouTube to share to the Fab City community. And um, you can activate below the captions on your main menu bar. So um, as I said, welcome to today's um, roundtable. Today with the aim, with the topic, um, project incubation and value creation. So basically discussing how does it work the from to get from the idea to action of projects. Um, I will give you a quick like overview. I will yeah. um, present. Yes. Can you put it in widescreen? I think because we see like a small. Uh, That's. Tab. It's just like a small tab, because the issue I had. There you before. go. Okay. Is it better? Yeah. Okay. Oh, wait one second. Let me share it again. Um, can you see it now in the white screen? Yeah. Yeah, Thank better? You. Better. <laughs> okay. So um, I'll just give you a quick overview of the like small presentation before we start actually jumping to the expert talks today. Um, just like to discuss quickly the aim, the full stack. Uh, we're actually building all of the round tables around the full stack, the framework of Fab City Global Initiative. Um, the agenda, the Fab City Foundation um, announcements and upcoming, what will happen after round table. Um, general, like today's round table, we're as part of the Fab City agenda, the Fab City community is gathering actually today for the first round table of four yearly round tables in 2023. So we're hosting um, every three months of Fab City round table is it's open for public um, to promote synergies and multi-level knowledge exchange within the global um, Fab City Global Initiative and also everyone who's interested in Fab City. So we're very happy to welcome you here today and to discuss um, today's on the today's topic. And yeah, the round table aims, aims at deepening the discussion around the Fab City full stack. So what is the Fab City full stack? Um, it's a framework that helps to interpret the Fab City challenge towards 2054. As we know, the challenge locally productive, globally connected, and to guide also the implementation and, uh, in a multi-scholar and also ecosystematic approach and also way of different kind of projects and so on. Um, about today's roundtable, um, we'll be focusing on the layer three of the Fab City Full Stack. You see it here on the left side um, of the graphic of the Fab City Full Stack. Um, the aim is actually today to present a general overview of value generated projects and its ecosystem by explaining the context, the key factors for successful innovations, as well as discussing frameworks, methods, business models, financing models. Um, that support the development of and utilization of such innovation projects. So, and yeah, exactly one year ago, we started um, hosting the first round table on the topic of platform ecosystem. And another free followed last year in May, but um, on the topic of new forms of learning, you see those like here on the left side, on the graphic, which one in which layer, um, and in December, in December, we discussed the strategies and projects um, of the Asian Fab City community before going to the Bali Fab Fest. And um, last but not least, the final round table last year was on distributed innovation infrastructure for local production. And yeah, today we're focusing, as, you, as I mentioned before, and the third layer. Um, yeah, this is the agenda of today. We'll start with a short name with a small welcome by Karina um, from Fab City Foundation. And then it will be followed by the expert talk with Caesar and Anna today, and as well as some key insights, key learnings from the, from the Fab City network. 
Um, this will be followed and also a bit like closed, rounded up with a Q&A. And um, afterwards, we'll have like some Fab City community announcements, some events and also projects that are coming up shortly in the, within the next three months and a closing. So therefore, I would like to oops, oh, yeah. invite Carolina to start. <laughs> With the announcements. Thank you so much, Ida, and welcome everyone to our first roundtable of 2023. It's a pleasure to be here with you. For those that don't know me yet, my name is Carolina. I'm part of the team of Fab City Foundation as ecosystem lead. So yeah, I'm going to be very brief. I just wanted to give like some highlights of Crapit, what happened in 2022. Uh, that was important for the Fab City Global Initiative, and also talk a little bit about Bhutan, our annual event. So yeah, Ida, if we could go to the next slide. Um, wow. Uh, for those that were in Bhutan or received our, our newsletter, there were eight new members. So we had um, one from Latin America that joined the Fab City Network, Guanajuato from Europe, we had two members and from Asia, we had quite a few, uh, mostly from Indonesia, Indonesia. So now we have a, like a big Indonesian cluster to work with. And also we had Bali that uh, joined as an island. So we have the Fab Island. And yeah, so now we're 49 in total with two countries, eight regions, one island and 38 cities in the global initiative. Also last year, um, if we could go to the next slide, Ida, uh, there were quite a few of important resources uh, that were built together with the, the members of the Fab City Global Initiative. So we had the Fab City book, and the previous book was from 2018. And then we had we launched in Bali the new book, the Fab City book, Designing Emergent Realities. They are all online and uh, free for download. Uh, we're going to share here in the chat. Uh, I think already Frida shared the links for, so you can download and check all these resources. Also, we had our first annual report where you could see like the highlights of 2023, the metrics, what we achieved this last year, right? And we expect to have this annual report by December every year now, from now on. So, yeah. Also, uh, we have the policy brief. Uh, it's our first policy brief. We expect it to be, we planned it to be actually as a series of policy briefs to guide cities to implement uh, and support them with public policies locally. So this is our first policy brief. Please check it. Uh, we think it's going to be a very useful resource uh, for localities. And hopefully by the end of the, the year, we'll have uh, quite a few of our series of policy briefs. Uh, all of these resources, um, you should have received them um, through our newsletter. So if you didn't subscribe to our newsletter, please do, because then you can receive all these news. And we're going to, by the end of, the, of today's roundtable, we're going to share some links so you can subscribe to our newsletter, to our blog post, and receive these, these resources and exchange a bit uh, throughout the year. So we, we also developed uh, uh, the Fab Island Challenge publication that um, um, explains the methodology of the Fab Island Challenge and also five case studies of, of the challenge teams in Bali. So it's a very complete publication what happened in Bali and uh, the impact of the challenge to the local community. So, I really advise you all to take a look and we expect to have the Bhutan challenge as well. So it's a good intro of how, how the Fab City challenge works and how we expect to work also in Bhutan. Also, we had the full stack uh, paper. Um, so this was presented during the, the conference, the academic conference in, in Bali and also the Fab City hub paper. So we also are getting more into academic publication as well. There's a field that's important also for Fab City. So expect us and participate with us in publishing papers this year in the topics that are interesting for Fab City. And um, yeah, all of these resources you will find on our web page. 
But mostly I would advise all of you to take a look at the Fab City Handbook because it's like our, we, we call it our Bible, <laughs> the index where you find all the information you need in Fab City. So you will find these resources there for download. And you'll also find information about the collective, the network, the foundation, and um, toolkits from different projects and different initiatives that we created uh, that we think are, are, are important to support like the implementation of, of the Fab City vision and mission. So yeah, so very briefly and very fast, uh, take a look at the resources. And uh, also if you have interesting resources to share with us from different projects that you're participating, you please feel free to, to message us an email and we can curate them and put them in our handbook for the community as well. So we can all uh, share the information we have. And very briefly, and then maybe Norella, I know you're there in the backstage if you want to interrupt me. Uh, we're planning already the Fab City, the Fab Bhutan, all right? So our annual event where we gather in person once a year. And uh, if we could go to the next slide, Abida. So the dates are already set. It's from July 16 to 28 this year. Uh, the ticket cost for the full day, for all days, is $500 uh, under the early bird that goes until the uh, March 1st, May 1st, sorry, not March, May. And there's only 300 tickets available. And uh, Bhutan has a very particular situation, right, regarding visit, uh, visas and the number of, of tourists that can enter the country. So it's a very new situation for us. So the visa process is covered by the ticket uh, fee for the 14 days of the event. And to get the visa, you first need to, to buy your ticket and you will need to submit a form of information uh, in order to start your visa process. So Bhutan uh, has these particularities, but we managed to cover the visa that's kind of um, costly and also you have to pay if I'm not wrong a uh, daily uh, fee to be able to to be in, in in Bhutan as a tourist and this will be covered by by the ticket and uh, the the plan for now the program is from 16 to 21 of July there's going to be the Bhutan challenge um, and the 21st uh, 23rd is going to be the Fab festival the, from 24 to 27, Fab Lab Conference and Symposium. And the last day, the, the closing will be the Fab City Summit and the Fab City Day, where the cities or new localities will pledge. And also we're gonna have uh, all the curated program for Fab City during the last day. So yeah, so get ready for Bhutan. The website will be launched this, this week. Uh, we expect it to be able to share today, but last minute it was not possible. But this week, for sure, you're going to be receiving information, more detailed information about Bhutan with the new website. And then, yeah, and we are always here to answer all the, the doubts and questions you might have. And yeah, I think that's it. Um, so welcome. I hope you enjoy the, the roundtable today with these amazing experts and uh, sharing the, also from our community, uh, from practical examples. And yeah, thank you. So on this note, I would like to welcome our two ex first two experts, actually, starting with Caesar from Singapore Institute of Technology and followed by Anna from Manufacturing Change with the expert talk um, discussing <laughs> how how key factors could incentivize value generated projects and also like how how do ideas become successful projects and also how to make value generated projects sustainable in the long term and so on so please caesar if you would like to start just to confirm is 10 minutes or five minutes i, I forgot sorry Love 10 minutes uh you could do 10 minutes okay perfect <laughs> If that's okay, I will share my screen. Mm -hmm. Okay, do you see my screen? Yes, now we can see your screen. Okay, thank you. I'll start, I'll start uh, uh, it. I'll start it. I'll start it. down. Okay, thanks, thanks all for having me as the, um, um, allowing me to share about the work that we're doing. 
And uh, it's also the first time I sort of introduced myself to the network because we really hope to join as a Fab City actually at Singapore. Um, so uh, some people know me because of the work that I do uh, in ocean robotics. So before uh, being like a, uh, on the organizer side of uh, Fab Lab, I was a user of Fab Labs uh, between in London or uh, in San Francisco, a tech shop or, or a lot of other places. And uh, so this is how I sort of started to have to uh, build a Fab Lab um, uh, in my own community because I was building uh, shape shifting boats and they're becoming bigger and, and bigger. Uh, I moved from, so I'm half French, half Japanese. I moved from uh, San Francisco to Hong Kong slash Shenzhen because I was looking to manufacture those robots. At the very beginning, I had a very small, well, I had a small workshop, 1,000 square feet, uh, that was built in the countryside uh, of Hong Kong in a rural area. And it was very, very basic, quite far away from quote unquote civilization. Uh, there was no water, no electricity, so we built from scratch. Uh, but quickly I ran out of space. And uh, this is uh, when I uh, contracted the, the lease uh, for a larger industrial space. And this is where really the, the community started to blossom. Uh, back then there was only a hacker space, a small hacker space in Hong Kong called Dim Sum Lab, which was really, really small. And it was on the 27th floor and it was a tiny elevator. So not possible to build anything of, of a broader size. Uh, and then eventually we, we grew up into a bigger and bigger uh, facility and uh, became the largest makerspace in, in, the, in the region. What's important to say is at the beginning when we started, because we're the first fab, fab lab or makerspace in, in the region, um, we even though we wanted to focus on social and environment impact, we did not advertise it uh, as such because it was already too new of a concept. So when we started, we just say we are a workshop open to everybody, a co-working co -working space, anybody can make whatever they want. But over the years, uh, we've done a lot of projects um, uh, with the re refugees, with homeless people, uh, with the ethnic minority and women of ethnic minority in particular. Um, and eventually we did so many projects uh, with the handicap and uh, like local social challenges um, that the largest charity called the Jockey Club asked uh, Make a Bay to, they wanted to give us money, but they could not do it because we're a social enterprise, a company, a business. And so they asked us to open a, another branch. So we had then, we had to open a new uh, Make a Bay called Make a Bay Foundation. And then we open mini maker space in, in partnership with the local youth center. So we basically open maker spaces in the poorest area of Hong Kong in public social housing complex, uh, where the rent is, uh, is subsidized by the government. And we would train uh, the social workers as well as the youth worker um, to get the student to have access to STEM education programs in, in those area, uh, working on local uh, issues uh, and uh, always like involving technology in a creative way. Um, over the years, we've done lots and lots of projects. Maybe those are like the, the most visible one. We built the first uh, self-driving car uh, or like semi-autonomous uh, self-driving car in Hong Kong for the Formula E uh, race. And this is like a very futuristic car, futuristic car, sorry. No front, no back, no seats, no steering wheel. Uh, it's, a, it's a driving car. So the idea was to make a point that, you know, you don't need any of those things inside. It's basically like a floating bed, if you will. Um, that was really fun. And it was built as an education program. Uh, and we've done a lot of partnership with the local NGOs. So we're doing the R&D for WWF. So here, for example, they ask us to track uh, every single rivers in Hong Kong. Uh, so we work with 11 local schools because we have 11 rivers in Hong Kong. In each of the rivers, we put 10 ocean drifters and we measure the speed at which it takes for the trash that we put on the streets to go onto the beach. And we found out that a lot of the trash that we found on the beach in Hong Kong is actually from Hong Kong and not from China. Uh, which was something that a lot of people assumed. So we are trying to like help local NGOs to do like a scientific research. But we've also started to go outside. Uh, we've organized three campaigns in Japan, in Fukushima, where we measure radioactivity on the seafloor and contributed to like map ra radioactivity uh, in the area uh, with the local fishermen uh, who are, you, you can see the fisherman is collecting the sample right outside of the nuclear power plant. It's also where they also fish and sell on the market. So it was important to, to measure radioactivity there. Uh, in Hong Kong, we developed our own um, uh, uh, sailing robots to map coral reef. So this is a machine. It's a basically a boat with multiple cameras that takes thousands of pictures, uh, all built in Mecca Bay, and using AI to classify the coral and uh, essentially like, study uh, coral population over there. One of my students, uh, so that was in, in collaboration with the HKU, Hong Kong University. One of my students from HKU made this into a company called ClearBots. Uh, and they are now they recently raised money from um, uh, 
uh, Razer and Microsoft and a bunch of other companies. So they are building those robots to gamify plastic collection in the ocean. <clears throat> um, as you can tell, my passion is the ocean. So we also work with the local fishermen, developing like low cost uh, farms. Uh, this is a more recent project. We build the, the first uh, floating solar hydrogen production. Uh, so this is more like an artistic um, installation. Underwater, we have um, oyster farms. And inside, we're using the solar panels that we have on the rooftop to produce a very small amount of hydrogen. So this was just a, um, a proof of concept. We can produce a tiny bit of hydrogen. We didn't have the permission to compress it. So it is just a, uh, to, to prove that we could do that. And at Fab City, uh, sorry, at the Fab Fest, sorry, uh, we sort of uh, changed the concept. And instead of making one big installation, we wanted to see whether it could make sense to fragment this uh, infrastructure and uh, make it a technology that, for example, the fisherman could deploy, produce low pressure hydrogen at very low cost. Uh, of course, it's not a lot of energy because it's low pressure, but that could potentially replace uh, for the uh, providing for you know, fuel for transportation, uh, electricity and gas for cooking. And so we are, I'm still very, very interested in this and I'm actually looking to come back in Bali um, in August uh, next year to actually build a larger plant in a crab farm. Uh, the reason why I'm also here and I really uh, want to participate to Fab City is because my university uh, is consolidating its many campuses. My university is very strange. It doesn't have one building. It has many buildings around the, the city, around the country of Singapore. And um, uh, in one year and a half, it would consolidate all of this campus and we're going to have a beautiful microgrid uh, campus by the water. And I'm going to be responsible for basically the, the, the Fab Lab of, uh, of, the, of the campus. Uh, and a part of the gardens, and I'm now working on getting access to, to the waterfront. And the idea would be to have uh, interactive exhibits for young people to get them interested in STEM uh, workshops where they can build things hands-on, and we can also train uh, the teachers uh, over there in the garden to build like tree houses and in the ocean do all the kind of things that I just showed you before. So we hope to, to do that. Why I think uh, we have a special uh, voice to add to the Fab City is because, as you know, uh, global warming is very real, but it turns out that 99 of the cities that are most exposed to climate change and the most vulnerable to climate change are in Asia, especially in Southeast Asia. And so uh, Singapore, being so much at the center of Southeast Asia and being sort of the financial center of Southeast Asia, I think has a very important role to play uh, because we have resources here. Uh, to actually deploy around the region to uh, to help and, and facilitate a lot of the innovation in the region. So that's why I think it's we, we have such an important role. The way that I'm trying to convince my university um, to actually become a Fab City is to actually articulate the whole contents of what we do on all these different levels, which is, as you know, the full stack. So uh, I'm trying to articulate it so that they understand that the small things that we do in our neighborhood participate to a bigger picture. Um, and so uh, I hope that we can not only uh, be a member, but can also create a lot of contents and give the consciousness to people of where this content fits in that bigger picture. I think that that would be very, uh, very important to do that. So uh, um, yeah, uh, that's all I have. Thanks so much. And so we are very, very excited to join the Fab City, and I hope we'll do that in you know the next three years or so. Thank you so much, Caesar. Um, for the for the introduction and also we we'll, would we'll be very excited to welcome you to the network. Um I could just hear some like some noise in the background. Um yeah I forgot to mention before if you have any questions during during the expert talks and also the Fab City Network key learnings please feel free to post them during during the time like in, in the chat we'll get back to them shortly during the QA. So, Anna, I would like to welcome you to the expert talk. Um, yeah. Thank you very much. I'll uh, share my screen. Please let me know when you can see the presentation. We can see it. We can right. see the presentation. Perfect. Um, can you see it full size? Or do I need um, to? It's not. It's not full. Full screen. There we go. But now it's full screen. Perfect. Okay. Thank you. Um, and thanks very much also for for inviting me um, to talk today. Um, so I'm going to be talking about the work that I'm doing on the on an open catalog of business models, um, which is being done as part of the Make Project. Um, 
the I've got the web address for that later in the um, presentation, but it's makeafricaeu.org. Um, the MAKE project is a, um, a three-year EU-funded project with um, a variety of different work streams looking at the maker ecosystems, particularly in Africa and the EU, and how we can build links between them um, and how we can um, prototype more distributed manufacturing infrastructures um, through that. Um, there's all kinds of really fascinating work going on in the project, which I don't have time to talk about today, unfortunately, but um, I do encourage you to, to look that up. Um, so the open catalogue of business models is one piece of work that's being done and it's what I'm focusing on. Um, the reason behind this is that a lot of maker spaces and fab labs are struggling. Um, there are, I've been involved in setting up uh, maker spaces in um, the UK. Um, I was one of the co-founders of Kamasi Hive in Ghana um, and I've been involved in, in setting up others in, in Kenya and in Jordan. Um, so for, I know from a sort of co-founder perspective what it's like to have the kind of pressure of meeting rent each month and, and salaries and so on. Um, and, you know, I talk to many people and there are some maker spaces that are thriving, um, but there are more, far more that are struggling. And this is in spite of them generating huge value for society. Um, and I want to emphasize that I'm not doing this work because I think that all maker spaces should be able to completely self fund themselves. Okay. I think there is um, a huge amount of public value creation going on and that there is a very strong case for, um, for public funding of different types. And in another project that I'm involved in, um, I'm working on some of the impact metrics for maker spaces to help make that case. Um, but we can't just hold out for an idealized state where um, there is lots and lots of, of public funding available for maker spaces. We need to have them sustainable. Um, sustainable in themselves and, and able to help support the creation of value generation enterprises in the communities that they're working in. So the idea is to create an online catalog, um, which will be released under a Creative Commons license. Um, it's expected to be released in July this year. It's going to cover business models, both for actual hubs or maker spaces and for small scale manufacturing enterprises. And there isn't a clear delineation between those. So, for example, um, in one place, you may have um, a maker space that's has revenue models based around sort of training, around membership, around renting out its space. Um, somewhere else, you may have one that, um, as well as doing some of those things and, and being a community maker space, has also decided to start producing its own products and selling those to help meet its running costs. So there's not a clear split, and we're looking at the, the full spectrum. Um, We've run a number of co-creation sessions to find out what kind of information is needed. And um, one thing that came out very clearly is that this is not just about describing a, a theoretical model and leaving it at that. Um, it's also going to include information on how it can be implemented in different ways. I wanted to talk about um, a couple of different examples that, um, that I've come across during the research work. I can only touch on a couple today and, and there are many more, but um, one of them is Beneficial Bio, which I think is a, a really interesting network model um, dedicated to ensuring that the future of biomanufacturing is for the many and not the few. There are um, independent social enterprises in a number of different locations contributing and working together as a network um, under the Beneficial Bio brand. Uh, they are making enzymes for use in, in biology. Um, primarily in research and also in, in some production situations. There are nodes of this network in the UK, in Cambridge, um, in uh, Cameroon, in Yaoundé, um, in Ghana, in Kumasi, um, and there's a, a new one developing in, uh, in Ethiopia, in, in Bahida. And I think that one of the important things, so, Knowledge about the importance of business models has really developed over the last five years or so, I would say, 
And there's a lot more emphasis on encouraging projects to look at what their business models are. But sometimes it comes too early, right? Um, some people think it should be like pretty much the first thing you look at. And I don't agree with that. I think it should be the second thing you look at. And the first should be, what is the value that you're creating for somebody else? Like whether that is for a customer or whether that's for society, I think looking at your value generation model has to come before you can think about how you can capture some value for your own sustainability from that. Um, the challenge, of course, comes when you are generating sort of more social or environmental value, which is not valued under the capitalistic system, uh, or where you are generating value for people who don't have the ability to pay or don't have the ability to pay very much. Now, beneficial bio is certainly um, generating value. Um, it's putting these difficult to, to reach enzymes into the hands of, of research scientists um, in places that have previously found it very, very difficult to get hold of them. I've spoke to one um, researcher in Cameroon who, before uh, Boa Lab started up the beneficial bio enterprise there, it could take her six months to get hold of, um, of these enzymes. And you don't know how many you're going to need like for a project so you know you, you have a limited budget you order the amount you think you're going to need it takes six months to come and then actually the power went out halfway through your experiment and the whole thing was wasted and so you need to order some more uh, it's it's just insane the kind of lead times that they have um so the value being generated is clear but that and the nodes are starting to become self-sustaining um but there's still a question over the business model for the network, and this is one of the things that is can be really undervalued in this um, locally uh, locally productive and globally connected enterprises, is the the global layer has to be funded too, and we don't always think about that um, as closely. So that's one example I wanted to highlight. Um, another one is CC for D, um, Community Creativity for Development, which uh, runs repair cafes and um, workshops and trainings on, on how to repair electronics in Rhino Camp refugee settlement in Uganda. And again, it's this is a situation where the value that they're generating for society is really clear. There are huge numbers of um, like mobile phones that break and so on. People need to be able to repair them. Um, the ability of those people to pay for that is very, very limited. So again, they've had challenges with their business model. Um, they do get some grant funding and um, sort of event sponsorship and things like that to hold repair cafes. Uh, another revenue stream they've found is that by offering their repair services for free, that they can charge for the components that they're selling to um, to replace things in, in mobile phones, for example. Because at the moment, people have to go to the nearest city, which is, um, you know, over an hour's journey away where you can buy these kind of components. And they're very expensive there. Whereas if the CC for D team is able to buy from the capital, which is much further away, they are a lot cheaper. And so they can sell them at the same price as they're being sold in the local city and, and, and capture the difference of that value. Um, so that's just a... a couple of examples. There are so many interesting examples coming up from this work, and um, we're going to be prototyping early versions of the catalogue over the next few months and releasing a first version in July. Um, if you'd like to get more information about that, the website is makeafricaeu.org. There's a newsletter on there that you can sign up for to um, get information about the releases. We're hosting a series of community discussions uh, on the third Wednesday of each month at one o'clock UTC conversations about different business models. And this month, uh, it says on their 15th April, it's wrong. It should be 15th of March um, is the next one. And that's around makerspaces working with artisans. Um, and I've also put it on this slide, again, the web addresses of the examples that I've mentioned in case you want to look those up more. And finally, um, my own email address at the bottom, um, my organization is called Manufacturing Change. Thank you very much. Thank you, Anna. Thank you so much for the very detailed presentation. I'd also like to introduce the MAKE project to today's round table. Very, very nice. Um, yeah. Um, 
Would you mind to stop sharing your screen? Because then I would like to introduce the next two speakers of today's um, key learnings from the Pop City Network. Um, Anna? If you could just like stop scary sharing the screen, if that would be possible, that would be amazing. As the as the admin, you may be able to um, yes to recover uh, it. Unfortunate or luckily, I'm not the admin today of the Zoom call. <laughs> I'm only the moderator, which is good enough. <laughs> so one second, I will share my screen here. So. Then we can um, continue today's uh, roundtable. And I would like to introduce today Guillaume from Fabla Barcelona um, to start like sharing the key learnings of Fab City Barcelona. And yeah, so Guillaume, the floor is yours. And just before you start, Carolina Marini from the Institute of Fabla Brazil and also from Fab City Belo Horizonte has an emergency, so she won't be able to join today's um, roundtable, but we will receive for sure um, great insights of her um, talk today in the Fab City News on the web page. So, Guillaume, when you're ready. Perfect, thank you. And thanks for having me. You listen to me well, yes? Great. So, um, yeah, thanks for having me here today. Uh, let me just share my screen and I will start. Um, okay, here we go. Okay, I won't use a presentation. I will go through some sort of key websites, let's say. I think it's also a good way so you can then, uh, they can then compile them all and you have access to them. Well, I think before we go into into detail, into projects, I mean, I think, and it's been said already, but it's very relevant to understand how actually the role of Fab Labs as Fab Lab Barcelona, right? We are one of the first Fab Labs that got established in the world, primarily in Europe. Transition from being actually a facility into being actually, I'll say, more of a space for knowledge generation and exchange, a um, space that actually works very closely identifying potential value in local ecosystems in particularly very much focused lately in local material flows but i think it's it, it actually touches in many other topics that i'll show you today um i think a very important topic that i hope i'll be able also to give you examples today it's it's what we describe as value right and what we describe as value at the end because i think what we are looking here is actually an initiative that will generate impact that will uh, drive change and that succeed in a way or another to be sustainable um, for that what i prepared today are examples of projects that either we have incubated here in the lab or accelerated it's always hard actually to know exactly what do we do maybe once we'll need to write actually what it means to incubate or accelerate for for fab labs or for fab cities and the second one are platforms platforms which um, maybe some are actually um, spin off already or actually separate ventures but some actually are ventures managed in a way by us or by a group of us let's say other fab labs included that are aim actually uh, at supporting the creation of more projects no ours i are aim at supporting uh, this uh, transformation um, of value are aimed to actually support the creation of more value generation projects. So um, first of all, everything I'm going to link today comes from the Fabla Barcelona website. So um, that's where we are. But let me let me start by putting you some some examples of specific projects. And then of course, I'll be happy to, to listen to your feedback, you know, and to go much more deeply in those projects that you think that are relevant. Fabla Barcelona, it's been part for many uh, years right now, I think it's actually almost four, of the Food Chief Project, which is a project, it's a European research project aimed at the transition um, from, let's say, uh, a meat-based uh, food diet into actually a much more plant-based diet, where actually most of the sources of protein that we obtain come from plants. In this context, we decided to create the Food Acceleration Lab, which was focused on um, food technologies, in particular because I think we all agree that food technology the way are mostly seen are um, aim at in a way maintaining the status quo in the food uh, supply system as we know it today right are mostly target at you know people for example when we think about uh, agriculture um, that actually do uh, big monocrops fields right and not actually in the scale of the uh, small producers we'll talk more about this later but in a way or another I think it's very important to us and when we talk about the transition in this case about diets we also think 
talk about a transition in the economy that we want to support these diets in the way actually that we want this to happen. So Food Tech 3.0 was very much focused on that, how actually we support existing uh, food initiative that in a way or another could benefit from the Fab Lab learnings, in particular on technology, but as well as in other fields. Because as I always like to say, I think what we are doing here has not only the potential and the knowledge that we think we have, but also the knowledge that we think that we don't have that uh, emerges from many years of running networks, from many years of implementing this distributed philosophy on the field. But going straight into the initiative that we support, and I just want to give you a sneak peek of some, so you see the kind of spin off, the kind of um, uh, um, startups in a way, uh, some of them are that we that we support on that. Um, Power, maybe actually uh, you'll be familiar with that project. It's um, it's a plan observatory for weather adaptability for resilience. So basically the concept is how we can enable the tools that are existing in big laboratories, which allow you to actually understand the growth of a particular species of plant um, in different uh, climate conditions, understanding that climate change uh, is here and will change the weather conditions uh, all over the world. So this uh, technology to actually um, run a plan against different weather conditions, it's something that's very well known in laboratories, but yet uh, it has never been a tool accessible for the small farmer, for the small researcher, for the small community to test that. And so Power at the end started with this idea, use FabLab tools to build um, one of those, uh, let's say, um, um, plant growing machines. But for, on top of that, it has been actually evolving into a full educational project that connects with agriculture, with plant-based systems and with climate change. Um, jumping to another one, that's a Tecton Garden. Tecton Garden is a project that's uh, trying actually to um, support um, roof agriculture in urban areas by designing much more efficient ways to basically run um, um, urban gardens. Uh, you know, like urban gardens in rooftops to produce food is something very well known, but yeah, there's always a lack of actually very efficient systems which are cheap enough to be deployed and are easy to maintain. Uh, they focus on that and through the uh, food tech program, um, they were actually accelerated a lot in the uh, design and in the electronics and mechanical design parts of their uh, design. Design. And now our venture that keeps moving forward, it's actually part of, uh, it's in a startup um, from the IRTA group at the UAB University. Um, moving forward, that's Bill of Greens. Bill of Greens initiative that already was a bit consolidated when we uh, when we started the, the project. Um, but again, actually, uh, what they were missing the most uh, were actually some of the um, uh, support in the way they actually um, package uh, their um, vegetables. So in this case, uh, there was a, a basically a, a war happening here at the lab uh, in this um, in this direction. Um, let me just do something very quickly. Hi, uh, Yes, this is. Um, then another one, uh, one that I think you might all know in a way or another because it's been very much on the news lately and was very much part of the Fab City uh, um, gathering a few months ago, uh, Domingo Club. Uh, Domingo Club was part of the exploration process. Domingo Club is a project that's trying to promote uh, tempeh. Tempeh, it's, it's, I think it's very well known in certain parts of the world, in particularly actually in Indonesia, but it's actually something that, for example, in Europe, um, few people knows about that. Uh, Domingo Club, um, um, to promote actually uh, Tempe, um, they, they took an approach that I think sometimes we, we don't emphasize enough, which is the capacity of Fab Labs, not only of um, designing and constructing things which actually support change as the technology is needed to support that change, but also the way we use uh, Fab Labs to build actually artifacts which support and raise awareness on the change that we want to happen. Um, I think actually that's, that's one of the ideas, for example, very much in the core of the Master on Design for Emerging Futures program that we do here. So um, it's very interesting how they went actually from designing tempeh incubators that could be made at the lab to actually they are they capitalize the full tempeh culture and they even created that specific for example um, um, artifacts such as uh, these uh, these uh, tempeh necklaces that you can actually wear and at the end discover how easy it is to uh, uh, to grow tempeh or to ferment tempeh um, 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 by using your the, the heat of your uh, human body. So that would be, you know, a compilation of some of the projects that we we help accelerate, incubate in this Food Tech 3.0. I could go more in detail, but I hope they're giving some inspiration on the kind of work that we do here at Fabla Barcelona and how we support uh, companies that are in a way a bit different than also as the standard companies that maybe you will incubate in a standard, you know, let's say a startup incubator. Um, 
Let me continue uh, with a project that I guess is also very well known to some of you. Distributed Design is a network that um, started five years ago, and it's trying to connect the design wall with the maker's wall. I think we all agree that more and more um, designers want to be makers and makers want to be designers. It's a lot of young people that they don't want anymore to sit in a wide room and design things to manufacture at the other side of the wall. They actually want to be part of the design and manufacturing process. And manufacturing means actually new ways of making things and it means actually distributed manufacturing and means also moving forward from distributed manufacturing into designing things which are actually designed already to be fully distributedly manufactured or designed in a distributed way. Um, the project connects to many topics, but I think what I wanted to show you today is a bit of the work that this project also does in supporting right other initiative in supporting this idea of incubating value generating projects. So if you uh, actually check, for example, the talent section, you'll see the amount of uh, projects by very young um, designers, which every year are part of that flow. And one particular project that it's very well known, but I wanted to show just to kind of see also where this goes. Uh, the distributed design program does uh, uh, every few years a challenge that's basically trying to support existing trends on distributed design and actually develop um, content around them, develop training, develop uh, knowledge around them that then will help to uh, uh, create new competences to uh, the new generations of designers. Uh, five years, four years ago, we did the Precious for Plastic Challenge that I think actually had a lot of impact in promoting the Precious Plastic Initiative and in particular in supporting the, the emergence of new designs that help the world exemplify what was possible to design with precious plastics, which new objects, which new aesthetics actually would emerge from these uh, precious plastics. Moving forward, the two other projects. Um, let's talk now about one project called um, Remix um, El Barrio. Uh, Remix El Barrio was a project where we um, work with uh, local designers, local food uh, waste producers, and local institutions in the neighborhood of Poblano, where we are located, to see actually how we could map um, the existing um, value waste um, to turn it into useful products, into useful things. So this process was not a process done by the Fab Lab. Again, similar to the work that I show you in the Food Chief project. We work with um, the local stakeholders. We work with local designers that thanks to that project, to that, I'll, let's call it incubation process, they establish actually their own businesses or ventures around, uh, in this case, using bio waste to create new products. That's Knife Factory. Um, they've been, uh, thanks to this uh, project, they started to work uh, first actually in how to use um, residues coming from, from um, uh, olive, but later on actually uh, um, opening uh, to uh, other material sources, other food, let's say, um, waste sources that basically help, help position them as the creators of, um, let's say, bio waste based uh, packaging materials. Um, and that actually now they are starting to explode commercially, they're trying to sell those commercially for some companies. Uh, you can even see, see here, for example, that's actually the retail um, uh, what they're doing now, basically using. Uh, biomaterials as part of the retail elements or um, um um, as part of their uh, company business. A similar project, also part of this initiative, it's the Coffee Matters, focusing using the residues of coffee to actually create a cellulose-based substrates, a paper that could be used actually to print on top as a communication material. And again, they are already starting to make slow by step by step their own business into actually uh, making um, um, basically uh, a communication um, uh, pieces, communication material, uh, you know, posters and signage that actually it's made uh, out of uh, the residues of coffee, coffee beans. Um, these will be examples in a way of a spin-off or initiative that um, uh, they went through Fabla Barcelona, they went through Fab City Barcelona, and thanks to that, now they are um, um, evolving, continuing, uh, or even started, thanks to that. Uh, sure. Let me just show you before we finish uh, what will be more kind of platforms that we, we develop or we develop in collaboration that support also these uh, uh, value generation, uh, generating projects. Um, the first one will be MakeWorks. 
And Maker is not a project that we started in our own. It's a project that actually, um, in a way, was given to us as a gift. And we are very happy to uh, that, that it happened that way. And that we have been developing during the last uh, three years, thanks to the Centrino EU project, where actually Fab City is also part of it. So in MakeWorks, we built um, a database of local manufacturers. So it doesn't happen anymore to you that when you want to make something, you type it on Google. And because of SEO, you end up basically finding a company that produces that in the other part of the world instead of one that does it locally. So you can go here in MakeWorks and you could explore manufacturers from different regions all over the world, which are basically uh, been established some for many years, some are very new, and that um, they have this approach into uh, making in the local context in many different fields. We have here from companies that work more what in a way will identify as a craft to companies that actually work more in what will identify as high tech uh, business, you know, as, you know, PCB making companies, uh, but they're all established in different regions. Make work is a long story. So if anyone's interested, we could talk about it a bit more uh, later on, but I think it's also um, a, the, a platform that shows clearly the importance of Fab Labs to actually establish platforms that will help Fab Cities to build uh, and to incubate uh, projects. Um, let me just show you a couple of more um, and then we go. Um, one which is I think very well known in the field of, of, of Fab Labs in a way, it's a Smart Citizen project. Smart Citizen started as an idea which was more of a critical design approach into what the existing Smart City was 10, 12 years ago. And now actually on its own, it's, it's a spin-off of Fab Lab Barcelona that makes open hardware, open source, um, um, software for um, um, supporting communities to monitor the environment, as well as uh, soft tools as methodologies to actually engage communities to do so, and to be part of this, let's say, sensing awareness and action workflow. And I think what's more important of these kind of projects is that they become not only at the end um, um, companies that sell hardware and software, but as well as big repositories of open hardware, which are then used by many other initiatives to build on top, right? A smart citizen contains uh, information that it's allowing a lot of communities all over, a lot of companies all over actually, to build custom hardware and software solutions to monitor specific environments, to monitor specific things. So in a way, these platforms or these projects are actually not only companies of its own, but companies that help establish new companies. Um, finally, a similar project into the East that got, uh, that's a bit uh, more recent is a Romi project. Romi, connected to the food tech I started, is basically providing open hardware and software tools for the uh, farming, for the, for the small scale farming, right? Let's say, I think we all agree that there's a lot of tools for monocrop farming, but there's few tools for at uh, these scales. So following that approach, we started to uh, combine farmers with fab labs, with a state of the art research in agriculture to uh, start designing and developing together Robots, but not only robots, so tools, software modules, et cetera, that could actually be combined to provide tools to farmers, to basically support this farmer that runs an, uh, a field of three to five hectares, and that maybe actually some of them are even gigs and are willing actually to, to, to engage on that. But actually, if we don't provide them with this kind of tools, uh, we know it's hard for some of them to, to, to sustain on the field or to be sustainable because the work they are doing, it's very labor intensive. Um, so Romy, I think, is very relevant because it's not only now actually an association on its own that has uh, its base in, 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 in Paris that actually it's promoting the access to these tools. So, and it's actually even developing custom solutions for different companies and different farmers, but it's also, again, a repository of open knowledge that supports other companies, other vendors to start building their own farm tools, their own robotics. So with this in a way, I wanted just to, uh, you know, give you a sneak peek of the kind of work we do here at Fabla Barcelona. I hope it will inspire you um, in, uh, in, in the way that we could make actually Fab Cities to incubate, to generate uh, value uh, by looking at these, these examples. Thank you. Thank you so much, Graham, for the very brief overview. A lot of different projects were relevant projects. We've seen them already a couple of times. I think it was like within the Fab City community. Um, therefore, I would like to open the floor for the Q&A for maybe like another like 15 minutes before we start the Fab City community announcements. It's always like very exciting to see like the experts and also like the projects and 
said, like the initiatives which are always like connected to each other. And um, yeah, so if anyone has any questions, please feel free to unmute yourself and we can discuss it then within this um, informal setting. So, Caesar, you have a first question, please. Yeah, okay. <laughs> So um, there are other cities that have, uh, you know, really bad air quality, much, much worse than uh, Barcelona. Um, and so I'm wondering, um, why do you think this sort of uh, innovation came from Barcelona uh, rather than from, from other places? What were the conditions that made uh, this possible? Thank you. Amazing presentation. Oh, thank you, Cesar. I, uh, I guess you're talking about the Smart Citizen Project. Tomas Diaz, I guess he's on the room. He's actually one of the founders. I, I was more kind of a supporter from the beginning and then become a project lead. Uh, so maybe he can even give us a much more detailed answer. But if you ask me, I'll say it came as a reaction, as an exercise to critical design, because Barcelona was one of the first cities that was trying to um, claim itself as a smart city. And it's very important to understand that this project never emerged as a citizen science project, was never meant to actually um, provide much more accurate data or much more data to science to actually do science. This is actually as a site, let's say, result of it. It was meant actually to trigger participation and to trigger action. Um, and it was very much established in the context of uh, looking at all these, uh, the web 2.0, right, that we all remember the days that actually we've, we saw that as a way that people will contribute to this idea of the commons, no? And I think a smart city is very much started with this, which is something that I think in Barcelona this time was starting actually to, to emerge. Uh, but yet it's true, actually, um, and I have to say that people think that the biggest community that this project has, at least in, uh, in, in terms of the number of centers, it's in Barcelona and it's not actually. It's in areas of the world that, um, that not all, but some of them are the ones that actually are much more affected by, by air pollution. And again, it's been also a very complex topic to bring those to those areas because it's a project as designed in Barcelona. Um, you know, it has a certain design flows as, for example, the cost that sometimes makes it hard to bring it to those companies. So to those countries, sorry. So again, I think it's very interesting to think of it as also an open software and hardware platforms where actually these cities these uh, uh, that might have local companies can take advantage of these blueprints and make much more cheap or customized versions of these centers that can actually impact on the places where pollution is very high. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I just said we have already some questions in the chat. I'm so sorry that uh, we just started like with Caesar before. Um, so Robin, I see that you posted it. Um, in the chat what data is available and how much is it uh, machine readable could you please explain us um exactly what do you mean by that and to whom should it uh, should be asked for of one of the experts uh yeah I it was about the make works a eh? about the make works project and yeah what data is available for from the participants or the entries into database I mean, okay. can I see how much, how, what machines they have or what can they produce? Is just textual information or yeah, how does it work? Okay, very good question. Yeah, I, at the moment, um, I mean, feel free to go to make dot uh, make dog works. Um, it's uh, onto the website. Um, you'll see that the way the way we decide to build this platform, it's very much in a very kind of handcrafted way, which means that you know, let's say, uh, it's not like Google Maps where you'll find all businesses. Is actually uh, at the moment we work by regions, and each region has certain responsibles which are mapping very carefully everyone who's being onboarded into that platform. So it's a very well created platform. Um, if you think about what information you'll find there aside of the location, you'll find um, the kind of machines they have or process that they accept as well as the kind of orders they do. And we actually had to build our own taxonomy that supports actually how we map those, you know, let's say different uh, type of fabricators, different type of uh, categories as uh, materials. Uh, on top of that, the data is that we don't have yet a public API as a very, very well-defined API but it's, it's already possible to query all the platform in a standardized JSON format. So, um, I mean, I won't go now into the technicalities, not to be too long, but if you uh, want, uh, uh, if there's a way you can put, uh, we can put us in contact with the Fab City Network, I can show you the way to access it because it's fully public. Perfect, thank you. Thank you, Graham. And I think also, uh, Robin, Anna answered also in the chat, 
um, regarding this question. So Anna, if you feel free, if you would like to add here something as well regarding like internet of production. I know that you're very involved there as well. Yeah, thank you. I just wanted to mention um, the Open Nowhere initiative, which is trying to um, which has defined a standard for the mapping of manufacturing capabilities, um, particularly with this objective in mind, making um, making these things a lot more um, um, interoperable. Yeah, um, that's a very yes. good point, Anna. I hope that we are able to actually add this into MakeWorks. Actually, there's an issue of rights for that already in the source code. Okay, nice. great. Um, and I know that, so that in, in the standard, um, we didn't define a taxonomy um, deliberately. It was sort of too difficult, basically. So I'm really interested to hear that you have defined one and, and perhaps we should be looking to, to collaborate about that. So I'm not working on it so much anymore, but I'll put you in touch with my colleagues who are. Thanks. I'm working, I'm like one of the core people from the Open Know How standard, which is directly related to Open Nowhere. So that's also yeah, where I'm coming from and why I'm asking. Perfect. Thank you. And I also see um, Paco, you had a question to Anna, if you would like to read it or shall to discuss it. Sure. Hello, everyone. Uh, can you hear me correctly? Yes, we can hear you. Uh, great. Uh, good morning to everyone here in, uh, from Mexico. Uh, yeah, this question is to, to Anna. I was very interested in what she was saying about the global funding, since in Mexico is kind of be a, a challenge to get funding. Um, like uh, most of it comes from the government and uh, there's some uh, issues related to that. And, uh, and you mentioned that the global layer needs to be founded too. So uh, based on that experience in, in Mexico, uh, how, would the, how would that work uh, having this like global funding layer? Um, thanks very much for the question. Um, so the first thing to say is, unfortunately, there isn't a simple answer to, to any of these questions ever about the business model. It's never a, um, we'll just do this and the money will flow, um, unfortunately. Um, so congratulations on there being um, quite a lot of government funding available in Mexico. That's that's good to hear. Um, I do understand that that comes with challenges um, and is, you know, not... Um, yeah, not always totally free money, but that's it's still good news that they're recognising the value. Um, the the challenge that I was talking about, um, the global layer, it, and it to be fair, it doesn't have to be global. It can also be a more local, but then it's the network layer that is often neglected in funding is the the organisation um, that are doing the the connecting you know like this one um organizing stuff like this um the fab city foundation is it's fantastic that it's doing this um there are a lot of networks that are trying to connect people and not really um figuring out a way to to get funding for that um so that's that's one of the challenges um I think there's also a need for us to, to think about how we can start creating global funding pools um, or, or regional funding pools that can be allocated down to different enterprises. Um, I was having a very interesting conversation recently about the idea of um, creating kind of uh, pooled funding for sort of social franchises in effect so that the um the enterprises could be independent but that you're still able to somehow bring them under under one umbrella so that they can be put forward as as one funding package because um either you're dealing with lots of individual funders lots of lots of small scale funders who will give small amounts of money and you're not able to to fund a large number of organizations through it or else they kind of want to deal with a traditional structure which is you know typically one company um so i I thought this idea of the kind of the social franchise approach might be a way to package up funding needs from a number of different organizations to make it um, more administratively easier for large funders to deal with. Um, but that's that conversations in its very early stages. So um, no easy answers, but I hope that's some food for thought. And I'm happy to carry on the conversation later as well. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. 
And I think this is actually a very good conversation that we could also shift like to our Slack channel or like to a broader community because I think this is like very interesting for the Fab City Network as we have like obviously European cities, but also all over and beyond all over the world. So I think the funding topping is a very um, good one to start with. Um, so unfortunately, we're running a bit very late <laughs> um, with the Q&A. And I would like to introduce the next part of um, today's roundtable, which is which is the Fab City community announcements. Therefore, um, I will share my screen again to introduce. So you should see my screen now. Um, to introduce Pietro from the municipality of Milan. He will give us a quick overview of Centrino and the focus group of Centrino, which is upcoming, which is with, which will be followed by Wolf from Fab City Hamburg and the event happening already starting tomorrow in Hamburg. And Carolina, which will be replaced by our Carolina from Fab City Foundation today um, on the event happening in Brazil. So Pietro, if you're here. I'm here, yes, thank you very much, Ida. And hello everyone, and good, good afternoon. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here with, with you. And it's a pleasure to uh, introduce the, the Centrino project, uh, which we at the Municipality of uh, Milan coordinate uh, with, with a partnership of 26 other partners, including the Fab City Foundation and uh, Fab Lab Barcelona, uh, among others. So Centrino is a four year uh, Resin 2020 research project that is focused on the industrial historic sites that are undergoing transformation. Transformation. It's aiming at showcasing the potential of these sites to become part of a new industrial revolution, putting citizens at the core of a sustainable transformation. So what we do is to leverage on the potential of underutilized historic spaces to become creative production and manufacturing hubs. Centrino is envisioning sustainable and inclusive features for the city and, and its residents. And in doing so, it will test and assess innovative strategies, approaches, and, uh, and solutions for urban regeneration processes in nine European cities. So we have actual research at the new world level and we will adopt the principle of circular economy in the new urban, uh, urban transformation process of industrial historic sites into productive and creative hubs. And as you can see in, um, in this quick, uh, quick slide, uh, Sandrina has five key concepts. So one is the, the heritage, the historical urban areas and the, heritage, the material and immaterial heritage they bring about. The social inclusion, so to bring in together all the, the social components with the with your neighbor and an area, <clears throat> the circularity of materials of the um, of the production flows, the vocational training to develop uh, the new skills that are required within this new uh, system, and the Fab City hubs as the, um, the final result of the um, of the project. So um, what we are doing now is um, that we are launching a um, we launched um, a focus group uh, with. Um, for applicants from all over the world. And we received 41 applications. So we have 41 members now, nine representing uh, from city hubs, uh, from city labs, four local authorities, uh, eight NGOs, sub, seven uh, SMEs, nine members from university and research centers, and uh, four, four members from other categories. And what we're doing is that we are going in depth into each of these five key concepts of, um, of Centrino in order to, to receive on the one end a feedback and a sort of a validation from stakeholders and other actors that are active on the same, um, same topics, on the same key concepts. And we're trying to align and look and learn from, uh, from their experience and to check and fine tune what we're doing in, um, in Centrino. But also, and, and probably most importantly, we are also aiming and at showing and looking and discussing with the, with the stakeholders and with, with these members of the focus group, how they could possibly uptake or adopt some solutions that we're testing in, in Centrino in other contexts um, around, the, around the world. So what the next step will be uh, at the first workshop of the focus group will be on heritage on the 9th of March, so in a, in a few weeks. And then we're going to focus on social inclusion uh, on the 20th of April, then in mid-June on circularity, mid-September on vocational training and in mid-November on um, the Fab City Hubs. And just so the, the last thing, the, the way we are organizing these this workshops is that we're going to have a, a quick overview um, and presentation of how 
uh, we, we understand the, the specific cost in Centrin, no? and then how we apply that in, um, in the project throughout our, all our nine, uh, nine pilots. And then we have a, a deep dive in, on two case studies that are model examples of this, um, of the application of this concept. And then we open for, for breakout rooms and, and a collective discussions and peer learning uh, exercises so that we can really make the most of the, um, this uh, engaging activity. So if you're interested, please uh, stay, stay tuned and follow us. Thank you. Thank you so much, Pietro, for the very brave overview. Um, I also wanted to mention that Guillaume mentioned it also like Centrino before because um, uh, Fab City Barcelona with Fabla Barcelona is a part of the pilots of the Centrino project. Um, yeah. So therefore, we're actually coming to the... Hello, can you hear me? Yes, um, we're coming actually to the next community announcement, uh, which is to the final conference of the Interfacer project. You might have heard already the Interfacer project and the future of making um, through the newsletter last week and also for all of the socials. So, well, if you would like to give a sneak peek of what is coming up this week. Um, I think you're muted. Is it no better? Yeah, now we can hear. Okay. Yeah, now we can hear. Okay, let's start again. Yeah, thanks, Ida, for introduction. Um, yeah, my name is Wolf Kühr. I'm leading the communication of the Interfacer project. And we presented, I think, nearly uh, exactly a year ago on the roundtable. So you heard about. Um, so now the project coming to the end and we will um, have our final conference. So I prepared a very quick and dirty tour of the program, which is composed by workshops, keynotes, talks, meetups, and an exhibition. Yeah, first we kick off the, the conference with a workshop, the first and second March. Uh, so in the, like tomorrow, but this will stay, um, top secret for the next three minutes because Thomas will talk about it a little bit later on. And yeah, we have a quite brilliant uh, panel of uh, key speakers, most of them you know. Yeah, Thomas, I told already, there's Neil Gershenfeld also, but there's Francesca Bria, which you know probably also, she was speaking in Paris at the summit in 2018. And then we have William Neal, who is the circle economy expert at the European Commission. Um, yeah, one of our main outcome, the Fab City operating system, will be presented in several talks. So we now divide it in two parts: the Fab City OS suite and the Fab City OS core. If you want to know more about it, please come to the conference. And we also will celebrating the launch of the Open Tool Chain Foundation that supports open source software for open source hardware. We'll have a, um, a workshop about circularity and data in the local textile industry. Um, then we will have uh, several community meetups um, where the Internet of Productions Alliance, the Global Innovation Gathering, Manufacturing Change and so on, uh, will meet there and using the conference to gather their communities there. And then there's another section, part of the conference exhibition, um, which results from the project. Um, first, we had the um, 50 build workshops we did together with citizens uh, in Fab Labs, and the results will be presented there. Um, then we had the, the Maker Challenge. This was a public call to citizens from Hamburg to submit uh, innovative ideas uh, that have been prototyped afterwards in Fab Labs, and then presented also there in the exhibition. And there's also one area, it's the pop-up uh, micro factory, where you will see um, also the machines from Daniel and Gracia. You heard probably about him, um, who's working now since two years in Hamburg to build open source machines, which are also, so the, the plants are publicly available. And that's it so far. So I hope I could convince you to join us in Hamburg in the next uh, four days. 
otherwise uh, yeah we'll share some some links to follow up the projects um yeah that's it merci thanks thank you thank you all thank you all for the very brief sneak peek of the conference but we have also Thomas here who will also like add here something to the conference. Thomas Diaz. Um, I just want to. I'm and here. Could, yes. And introduce um, the digital ecosystem declaration, which is also a part of the future of, of the closing of. Yeah, yeah, sure. I mean, very quickly, as I know that we are uh, late on time. Um, as part of the growth of the Fab City Global Initiative, I think that the complex, as long as we go, the complexity increases, right? Uh, with new nodes, it comes uh, new realities, but also when we have uh, increased participation of people, the coming, you know, larger amount of ideas and also approaches to solve some of the challenges that we have inside the foundation. Not only the foundation, but also the global initiative, initiative as a whole. No, um, one of them is related with uh, the digital infrastructure, right? Uh, how we, you know, as a as a global initiative, can develop a, a healthy and and, and ecosystemic uh, digital infrastructure that uh, shares some of the ethical values that we all share, but also uh, embraces. Uh, and collaboration at its, at its core, no? So in, in the past, probably, uh, when you have a project such as this scale, with, with this scale, maybe some people will gather some resources and will develop like a one single platform, one Fab City platform with one single user, maybe powered by Microsoft, in which you all uh, will log in and will have access to whatever Fab City services, digital services. Uh, we can offer or or sell, no. But following the spirit of what we're trying to do, we believe that it's, it's more interesting to work on a on a set of principles, protocols, uh, and and intentions to build this ecosystem together, to build this infrastructure, these digital assets together. So with this declaration, we aim to put everyone in the room and say, hey, uh, we many of us have uh, have a lot to bring to the table. Um, maybe different, you know, as you see in Barcelona, there is MakeWorks and Smart Cities and there are digital infrastructure and digital platforms, um, but also the Internet of Production guys are working on and 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 in 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 also in, in valuable work that is related to this uh, Wikifactory, uh, GitHub, GitLab. So how we can the work of Ben Kool that we're going to see also on the PKC. So. We're trying to set a, com a shared common protocols and 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 also set up um, this forms as a working group of of build this digital ecosystem within um, you know a, a safe space I would say and also by welcoming um, people's ideas people's contributions and and this starts very vague very big but then as long as we go we hope to make it more more detailed and more structured. Thank you, Ida. Thank you, Thomas. And also Frida shared the link um, in the chat. On the one side, we're having the workshop, which is starting tomorrow and is happening also on Thursday. And this big ceremony will take place on Saturday, but all details within the link. So we're very excited to welcome you there as well. So as you see, we have like a lot of, a lot of events are happening within the community. So it's like a very, uh, exciting upcoming month and upcoming weeks um and i would else as well um ask carolina if she would like to present the fab city network event in brazil in curitiba upcoming month so that you all have like a bit of a glimpse what is also happening um outside of europe sure thank you Ida. So Carolina Marini from the Brazil Institute, Fab City Institute is not, was not possible to join us today. So I'm representing her. I'm also Carolina, I'm also from Brazil, <laughs> but I'm from Fab City Foundation. And uh, well, Brazil, uh, th there's an event in Curitiba from, you'll see the link Frida will share with us in a minute, um, that is gonna happen from the 22 to the 24th 
of March, and it's a smart uh, city expo in Curitiba, the same uh, smart city expo that happens in Barcelona. And what is happening is that the Brazilian Fab City Network, the five cities that they, they are in Brazil, they are using this opportunity of a, a major event that's happening in one of their cities, Curitiba, to gather the five Fab Cities there. So what's going to happen is that they're going to gather the five Fab Cities, they're going to plan 2023, some common objectives and maybe a common project that they want to develop in Brazil. And also maybe an opportunity to onboard or to invite new fab cities or new fab regions in Brazil. So this is a, a um, we wanted also to showcase this a bit because we think it's a good opportunity that uh, some regions uh, identified big events and use this opportunity to gather the fab cities around them to do community building, networking and planning and, and knowledge exchange. So yeah, so we'll we'll keep you uh, informed of what happened there, and maybe some things very similar will happen in Guanajuato in April. So we're we're stimulating this kind of 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 gathering from our community and and showcasing and also exchanging information. So yeah, we'll we'll keep you informed. Thank you so much, Carolina from Fab City Foundation, also from Brazil. Um, yeah, so we're coming slowly to an end. It was like a very tight agenda today, as I mentioned at the beginning of the round table, but a lot of information, so a lot of also um, ideas, hopefully new ideas, some inspiration for your project. And yeah, I would like to share my screen one last time for today, <laughs> then we're done. Um, and I would like to invite you to um, keep yourself updated and to exchange with the community. On the one side in Slack, my colleague Frida will uh, post the link in, in the chat. Subscribe to the newsletter, also to keep updated with all of the events, with the focus group, what Peter was, of Centrino, what Peter was mentioning, also about the future of making conference and the digital ecosystem declaration, what Tomas was presenting and what Wolf was also presenting before and as well the Brazilian network event and Mexican as well, very, very soon. So, and read the Fab City blog. Our team is always posting a lot of interesting information with, uh, with, um, of the Fab City Global Initiative of the whole community there. And last but not least, we would like to announce already now that you already mark your calendars in red for the 30th of uh, May, I see here that I have a typo, it's not 22, it's 23, 30th of May um, for the next round table and we'll be discussing um, the, the layer of the bioregions, so applying bioregional developments, we'll have um, experts talking and also some news of the Fab City Network. Thank you so much, a big, big thank you to all of the speakers, thank you for sharing so many great insights at today's round table and hope to see you very, very soon um, in Slack or at the next round table or in Hamburg or in the Centrino focus groups or in all of the cluster events. Uh, so there's a lot of things going on. Thank you so much. Thank you. I will wait for you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Big hugs from Brazil here. <laughs> We got some Spain back. Yeah. <laughs> Hello. Hello. <laughs> oh. <laughs>